Okay, so to start off this last lecture, I want to pose a concrete uh, question. Let's say, um, well, we have a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. What's the density of primes where the polynomial mod P has a root? So let's, P will be a prime where the polynomial reduced mod P has a root in Z mod P. So for example, if the polynomial were uh, T to the fourth minus two, you're asking for which primes is T a fourth power mod P. So this has a root in Z mod P for the following uh, sequence of primes, it starts off 7, 23, 31, 47, 71, 73, and so forth. There's no apparent simple rule here. Um, I don't know, anybody find one? Yeah, there's a rule. They're all prime numbers. A list of primes happens to all be prime. It looks like if you add one to all of them, they become multiples of eight. Okay, well, there's always a finite number of exceptions. All right, so so much for that there. Maybe that's why I wrote 73. Then, then after 73, you get 79, 89. There's another counterexample. So you, you can make conjectures, but then you, you don't want to calculate it far enough. So let's, um, let's try to count for various, let's go through the powers of 10. Let's count the number of primes up to x for which uh, two is a fourth power mod P. And we'll do a density estimate. We'll divide by the number of primes up to X. And here's what the data looks like. The data look like 100, let's see, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. And the proportions, the several decimal places, the first one looks like 0.36 then 0 0.34523, 0 0.36777, 0 0.37343, 0 0.37502. And if you want to take a guess what the limit might be, what? Three eighths, three eighths, 0.375. Okay, so let's, uh, in fact, that is the correct answer. And let's see how the Chebotarov density theorem helps us to figure this out. So what we need to do is we need to look at the field generated by a fourth power, excuse me, a fourth root of two, and then the, uh, the Galois closure of that field. So this is the thing we want to try to figure out here. So we have um, Q, Q would join the fourth root of two, the Galois, smallest Galois extension containing it, is Q joining the fourth root of two and I? If you look at the ring of integers, it's Z, Z bracket the fourth root of two. What was the least N for which the ring of integers is not Z bracket the nth root of two? Nope. Yes, 1093, right? The first Vferic prime base two. Oh, it felt like so long ago. All right, and then the ring of integers, which is not z bracket the fourth root of two comma i, it's bigger than that. All right, so um, this has degree four, this has degree two, rank four, rank two. Okay, and as far as the Galois group is concerned, as with Galois theory, you always write things upside down. So we'll write g for the the big Galois group. Um, it's generated by elements r and s. We've seen this before where R multiplies the fourth root of two by I and it does not affect I while S does not affect the fourth root of two and it changes the sign on I. And then that's the Galois group K over Q. The Galois group K over the quartic field, we we'll call this H. This will um, be a subgroup of size two and one and the complex conjugation S fixes that. All right. So when does the polynomial t to the fourth minus two 
mod p. So this has a root. What does it mean to say this has a root in z mod p? I want to express this in terms of Frobenius elements connected to the Galois group of k over q. So the idea is that somehow we want there to, it should, there should be some kind of meaning to a fourth root of 2 mod p in the field z mod p. How do you characterize z mod p among finite fields of p power size? We'd want the fourth root of 2, I don't know, its p power should equal itself. That kind of singles out the, the elements of z mod p among finite fields of characteristic p. And so um, the uh, more precise way of putting that would be that there should be a prime ideal q dividing p in the ring of integers for the fourth root of two, so that when I mod out by that, since it generates the ring, I should just be, it should have prime size, z mod p. And what that should mean, if one is careful with things, is it should mean that um, using a prime ideal that divides that prime in the big ring of integers, where k is Galois over q, this would turn out to mean that the, uh, the Frobenius element for k over q at that prime ideal, when you apply it to the fourth root of two, it, well, it should fix it. And so that means that this element, this Frobenius element at the prime ideal up in k, it should actually fix the element fourth root of two in the field k. And well, the elements that fix the fourth root of two are the reason because if the fourth root of two is, yeah, if it's p powers itself, then you're saying that the Frobenius on the fourth root of two is congruent to the fourth root of two. And um, yeah, x to the t to the fourth minus two should have distinct roots. So anyway, so it has to fix the fourth root of two. And so this means that this element in the Galois group of k over q, this should be one or s. Now, if you change the prime ideal, you conjugate the Frobenius element. And so if you want to make this a more intrinsic thing about the prime number in the bottom, it's Frobenius conjugacy class should belong to the union of the um, conjugates of the subgroup H that fixes the fourth root of two, one and S. Well, it turns out that the subgroup H up there at the top, it only has two conjugate subgroups itself and R H R inverse. Every other conjugate subgroup is the same thing. So this is H together with R H R inverse. Anyway, it turns out to consist of one S and um, R squared S. This is not a subgroup, a union of subgroups, doesn't have to be a subgroup. And so there are three of these things. And so the Chebotar density theorem, so we took the condition of the polynomial mod P having a root in Z mod P and in terms of the Galois extension, k over q means the Frobenius conjugacy class at that prime ideal, at that prime number, should be one of those three elements. That's a union of two conjugacy classes. One, an s and r squared s is a conjugacy class. So the Chebotarov density theorem tells us that the, um, the natural density of this uh, set of primes, I didn't even give it a name. Let's call it s for some reason. So the natural density of this set S should be three over eight. There's your three elements from conjugacy classes, okay? And in fact, quite generally, for any irreducible polynomial with integer coefficients, um, monic, let's say, and, um, and K is the, uh, Galois closure, the splitting field of Q adjoint alpha over Q, the minimal Galois extension containing Q adjoint alpha where alpha is a root. So this is like T to the fourth minus two and the fourth root of two. Um, if we let G be the Galois group and H be the group corresponding to that field Q adjoint alpha, So we have the diagram K contains Q alpha, contains Q, and G contains H, contains the identity. 
that's just from Galois theory, and the um, the set of primes p such that f mod p has a root in z mod p. Well, this will turn out to be this set will turn out to have natural density. Does anybody want to guess a formula in terms of what we just discussed? Based on what we just did, maybe not. Yeah. Right, the sum of the union of the conjugate subgroups to A. So there's a lot of overlap, like they all overlap in the identity. That is not the size of the subgroup, it's the size of a, some conjugate subset, conjugate stable subset. So that rational number is the, de is the natural density, okay? And so the, the proof is basically similar to what I did in the example, all right. So, um, so that's kind of cool. We talked last time about the natural density of the primes where the polynomial totally splits into linear factors. That's one over the size of the Galois group. So this is a, a different question. When does it have a, at least one root, not all of its roots? Okay, um, let's look at a different problem. Let's change the question. We'll look at some statistics after posing the question. What's the density of, let's look at the set of primes P, not, we'll call it S again, not two or five, such that one over P has an even decimal period. Okay, so in terms of modular arithmetic, I'm saying 10 mod P, has even order because the decimal period of one over p is the order of 10 mod p. Okay, question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, if, if I, instead of x to the fourth minus two, if I look at what? x squared minus n. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that if you have a number that is not a perfect square and you look at the set of primes P, for which A is a square mod P, that that has density one half. Yeah. Well, Um, I mean, in this case here, I'm not, I mean, the way I just, the way I sketched the proof of the Chebotarov density theorem, you use basically the art and reciprocity law, but in this application, we're just, we're converting things into statements about conjugacy classes. So your question about characters would amount, would really show up if you actually looked at the proof of the Chebotarov density theorem. You're trying to isolate one conjugate class from the rest, then you, you might use something like characters depending on what you want to do. I described how to reduce it to the cyclic case, and you really would use characters. But that's where that those ideas would show up, not in this application. They're kind of hidden away. Yes. Because what I want is I want some prime ideal lying over P in the in the big Galois closure to have its Frobenius element in that little subgroup generated by S. So as you vary the prime ideal over P, the Frobenius element will conjugate to something. So it might not lie in one S anymore, but some conjugate of it will. So a kind of a more, since we can only attach to the prime number downstairs, a conjugacy class of Frobenius elements, I will make a conjugacy class statement. 
So instead of saying there's an element in this subgroup, the conjugate class of that element lies in the union of the conjugate classes of that subgroup. That's 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 a that's a conjugate invariant statement. Yes, 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 yes. Very important. Yes, this is so. Here we're talking about the uh, the Frobenius conjugacy class associated to P. So you associate to a prime ideal upstairs the unique for all the finally many prime ideals the unique prime ideal in the the unique element in the big Galois group that modulates that prime ideal looks like raising the little p power. And if you want to think about of some, this thing as a function of the prime downstairs, then you want to see how does it vary as I change the prime ideal dividing little p upstairs, and it changes always by conjugates. And so therefore the conjugacy class, as you let the prime ideal vary while still dividing p, that's the intrinsic thing you can associate to the prime number downstairs. You have the Frobenius element. This is the Frobenius element at this prime ideal in the Galois group versus the Frobenius conjugate class associated to p, the prime number p. In the Galois group, yeah. Since that subgroup is not normal, the conjugacy class, I mean, one in S is not a, S is not unchanged into conjugation. So when you conjugate, you get a few more things. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's think about the primes where one over P has an even decimal period. So 10 mon P has even order. Be careful. I'm not saying 10 mon P is a square. To say 10 mod p is a square is equivalent to saying the subgroup generated by 10 in z mod p star has even index, not even order, right? So complementary concepts. I'm not saying it's obvious that these are equivalent to each other, but when you ask how often is a number a square mod p, if it's not already a square number, you expect it to be a square modulo half the primes, right? And you can prove that with Dirichlet's theorem or Chebatarov, but this is a different question that I'm posing. How often is the subgroup generated by 10 mod p of even order, not of even index? So we don't don't expect necessarily that the number is even. Well, actually, since I say even period, they go, well, there's even period and odd period, and you know the way these things go, it should be 50-50, right? I mean, if I said the answer was like three fifths, wouldn't that be weird? It's not three fifths. So, so let's, uh, so is the uh, density of S equal to a half? You know, anytime you have two options, even and odd, it should be 50-50, right? So let's take a look at X and the, uh, the count of primes up to X for which one over P has an even period. Count that, divide by the number of primes up to X. All right, so um, if you count the primes up to 100, this proportion is 0.52. Hey, pretty good. Count up to 1,000, it's uh, 0.648809. Oh, uh -huh. what happened there? 10 to the fourth, 0.666395. It's going the wrong way. 10 to the fifth, 0.666597. Conclusion. Yeah, so is, is the limit. It's two thirds. <gasps> See, it's not always true that if you have even or odd options that it should be 50 50. Notice, I mean, this is, if you're asking about how often is 10 a square mod P, square and non square, half the numbers are squares mod P, half the numbers are not squares mod P, and the density as you vary P, it really is one half. But this is a kind of complementary question, and it is not one half. That's kind of striking. Um, so this this was an observation. This data this was observed um, by Krishna Murti in. I don't know if that sounds like observed by Smith. I don't know if, um, but in any case, um, 1969 in the Journal of Recreational Mathematics. They kind of observed this and he pointed this out. It's like, can anybody explain this? And so then, um, and it was settled in 1981 
Adoni showed indeed the density is two thirds. And I'm not gonna go through the details of the proof. I'm just gonna point out that the, what the proof uses, something we have not done so far, it's gonna use, it uses the Chebotarov density theorem for infinitely many number fields. In fact, the proof, so the proof uses the Chebotarov density theorem with error term. This is the first time we're seeing this showing up here in an important way. Use the Chebotarov density theorem with an error term for all the fields Q adjoin. Remember, our original question was when does basically when does 10 mod P have even order in math terms? Decimal period in normal human terms. Um, so you need to look at Chebotarov for all the take all the two power roots of zeta ten of ten and adjoin the uh, two power roots of unity. So these are this is the splitting field. This is a Galois extension of Q. This is the splitting field of t to the two to the r minus ten over Q. You adjoin one two to the r root of ten, and then you adjoin all of the um, roots of unity of two to the r power order, two to the of order dividing two to the r, and you get all the roots. And so um, he used Chebotara for all of these fields with an error term. The point is that this problem, although the limit is rational, it is not in fact an application of the Chebotara density theorem to a number field. You use the Chebotara density theorem for a whole family of number fields. And if you're trying to study these densities and all these different number fields, you need not just that, I mean, you know what, you know, you could address the Chebotara density for each individual number field. Oh, there's some limit, has some value, but you kind of want to add up what's happening everywhere. And so you really need, basically need, want to keep track of the error term, find an error term in how quickly you're approaching the limit at each stage in the Chebotara density theorem so you can control things overall. Okay, so, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a formulation of the Chebotarov density theorem with an error term later on, but let me just mention, just to give a broader context here, the typical situation is that uh, if L is a prime number, like the prime two, and let's say A is an integer greater than the two, as long as it's not an Lth power, then, the uh, the theorem that Adoni had proved was actually that if you look at the density of primes for which a mod p has order divisible by l, not just even order, but order divisible by some prime number, um, is generally l over l squared minus one. So when you set a equal l equal to two, we get two over four minus one or two thirds. So the general you want to know how often does a number fix the number a, reduce it mod p, um, is it order divisible by a chosen prime l? It turns out to be given by this simple expression. The proof is very complicated because you need to apply Chebotarov to, um, to infinitely many number fields in the context of this problem. Now, I said typical because you do run into some, some situations where this formula is not quite correct. Um, and so, um, I should point out that if L equals two and A equals two, it turns out that the, if you look at the density of primes P for which two mod P has even order, this would be suggesting the answer should be two thirds. It is in fact 17 over 24, which is a little bit bigger than um, 16 over 24, which is two thirds. So the answer turns out to be a little bit different. Um, why is the answer different? Oh, just look at the proof. <laughs> like, well, there must be some kind of little basic basic reason that um, that that we run into problems. And um, basically, the issue is that when you use the Chebotarov of density theorem, you need to know the degree of these fields, right? These fields that are showing up. You know, how big are they over Q or you know, what the Galois group? What's the size of the Galois group? So you need to be able to compute the degree of these fields. And you should have a feeling that these radicals, these two power roots of 10 and the 
roots of unity should kind of be independent of each other and should help you to, and you, you might use that information to compute the degrees. But the problem is, um, the reason that this, this, uh, the situation is different is that Q adjoin root two happens to be inside of Q adjoin zeta eight, right? When you take the two power roots of 10, those really have nothing to do with Q adjoin the two power roots of unity. They're kind of disjoint from each other. They only intersect in Q. But when you take the two power roots of two, like the square root of two and the two power roots of unity, well, actually there's a step at which one of those extensions Q adjoin root two is already inside of Q adjoin zeta eight. So, so there's some complications when you're trying to compute the field degree. Okay, so the, the calculation of the field degree of two power roots of two adjoin two power roots of unity over Q is, is I'll just say it's tricky. Okay, there's a little bit of unexpected um, intersections showing up there. All right. Um, Okay, so and I, I should say, um, so Hasse had proved a theorem along these lines earlier, um, just using Dirichlet density. I don't know why he wasn't sophisticated enough to use natural density. Um, he was a pretty good mathematician, but I guess he was just satisfied with Dirichlet density. Anyway, are there any questions? Yes, sir. That is coming up on page four of my notes. So fasten your seatbelts. Let's, um, so we will address the question of primitive roots with Chebotarov um, later on. So let's uh, switch colors, go to green. And what is Chebotarov with an error term? So let me tell you what, how that looks, Chebotarov with an error term. So the first thing to tell you about is the prime number theorem with an error term. So these, this idea of giving the main, the asymptotic in the, in the theorem, I wanna write the count as a expected limit asymptotic plus an additional term and bound that so it's of lower order than the main term. So um, first, so these ideas go back to um, Ligarius, Lisko, they wrote the first paper in the 1970s on kind of trying to find a kind of concrete error terms in the Chebotarov density theorem. Then Sayre, a few years later, took their work and made some refinements to it. And people following them continued this, this kind of work. Um, and so let me first discuss the uh, prime number theorem with an error term, because that's the special case where your Galois extension is Q itself, and you just take the trivial conjugates of class with a trivial group. So what's the prime number theorem with an error term? So we write as usual pi of X for the number of primes up to X. And so the uh, prime number theorem with error term would say, you know, if X is at least two, that pi of X differs from the integral of one over log T. So the prime number theorem Kind of the best form of the prime number theorem would say pi of x, you might say asymptotic to x over log x, but this log integral integrating one over log t from two to x is the better asymptotic expression because you can get um, error bounds with that. x over log x is a much worse approximation in that sense, even though it's asymptotically the same as this integral. So um, the error bounds that you can prove so far um, to date all have the form some constant times x, oh, I should say, so this integral grows like x over log x. So I want the error term to be something uh, smaller. And what can be shown, unless you're willing to assume the Riemann hypothesis, um, it's kind of just barely better. A constant times x times e to the minus b square root of log x for some constants a and b. And the point is that the integral grows like x over log x and this error bound x over an exponential power of the square root of log x and that that go that grows slower so it really is of lower order it's not a very exciting looking expression and not at all what we think the truth should be if you want to use the riemann hypothesis 
you can do much better and say the difference between the counting of primes and this integral is no more than some constant times root x log x. So basically, you cut down to something on the order of root x instead of something just barely below x itself. So definitely of smaller order than the integral. Much more substantial bound on the error than what we had first. But these are the kind of typical error term bounds in the prime number theorem. All right. So what is the uh, Chebotarab density theorem error term look like? And for this, I'm just going to state it for Galois extensions of Q. Everyone who's the work by Ligarius and Olisco and Sayre dealt with the general Galois extension of number fields, but the, all the ideas can be seen. Um, Chebotarab density with error term. For let's say a Galois extension of Q. So we have, um, we'll write pi sub C of X for the number of primes up to X whose Frobenius conjugacy class in the Galois group is that conjugacy class. Ignore the final of many primes where it doesn't make sense. So then the theorem would be if X is at least two, then the difference between the prime count and absolute C over absolute G times the integral So again, this, this grows like X over log X. It grows like the number of primes up. It grows like pi of X, right? So the ratio of pi CX to pi X goes to C over G in magnitude. So the uh, error bound you get, well, the first error bound you get is something similar to what we see at the top of the slide. A, uh, not the same A, Ugh. okay, whatever. A X to the X times E to the minus B root log X all over the degree of k over q, so that when k equals q, you don't notice that denominator. Okay, so that's basically what it looks like for some universal constants a and b, independently of anything else. Maybe a is seven and b is five, or just some actual numbers that people are too lazy to figure out. Um, at least I am. So the GRH version, if you're willing to use the generalized Riemann hypothesis for zeta functions of of number fields of K and maybe it's subfields is we instead can say that the difference between these expressions, let's see what we have. Um, we had constant root X log X up here. And so here I want to see something that will specialize to that. And what you can get is size of C over size of G, which is one in the case of the prime number theorem times root X times um, N log X plus, oh, whoops, I left something out. I left out the uh, constant. So let me, um, whoa, I didn't mean to, uh, second, great. It all moved except for that little piece, the end there. So that's absolute deep times some uh, constant, some universal constant. So that's similar to what we have above because you know, where um, N is the degree of the field and D is the discriminant. And so when K equals Q, N is one and D is one. So it specializes exactly to uh, root X log X, root X times log X plus zero. So um, it does reduce to the previous thing. And um, so how is this of any use? How can we use something like this? Of what, so as an example, let's suppose you wanted to know, well, first let's suppose you could actually work out what these constants are, okay? And this has been done. People have worked out um, a couple of years, years ago, um, uh, Grenier and Molteni figured out, got some kind of nice, very down to earth concrete constants in these estimates and assuming GRH in this last estimate that I gave you. So one thing this can do is it can tell you, so a use of this is we can bound an X that would guarantee that pi CX is not zero. 
Look, Chebatarov says every conjugate class does arise as a Frobenius conjugate class infinitely often. So it has to start happening sometime. Let's figure out a bound for which it must happen by that point. You see, if the count were actually zero, let's see that this actually bounds how big X can be. Then in this bound that I have up here, let's, let's just say I, I'm, I'm gonna assume GRH, okay? Just to kind of get across the main idea. Using GRH, well, this is just zero, right? That's just, that's just zero, if we're assuming it's zero. And so then I just have this, this term is in both places, so I could cancel that. And so then what we get is we get that this integral is bounded by root x n log x plus log absolute d times a constant. And the point is the right side grows basically like root x times a slightly grow, smally, slowly growing thing log x, but the left-hand side basically grows like x over log x. The right-hand side basically grows like root x, well, times log x. And so the left side grows faster than the right side. So there's gotta be a point, we're gonna get a contradiction for, for big enough x. And so that will be the point at which pi c of x can no longer be zero. You must have met a conjugate of prime with below x, below that x where that conjugate class c is the Frobenius conjugate class of that prime. So in this way, you can guarantee if you have an error term in the Chebyshev density theorem, it can let you find a point before which all the conjugate classes have to occur as Frobenius conjugate classes for concrete primes. All right. Okay. The um, question came from the back about Chebyshev and primitive roots. So this is the topic of the Artin primitive root conjecture. So let me tell you about this interesting story. This is another use of the Chebyshev density theorem with error term. So um, remember, since a total coincidence that really that I gave a talk a couple of days ago on Vferic primes, it was very fortunate because now I can kind of tie it in here. So recall from the discussion of Vferic primes, that typically what happens, let's say for integers at least two, usually if a prime doesn't divide A, the order of A modulo every power of P is just the order of A mod P times P to the K minus one, right? As you, as you ramp up the modulus, the order just increases by a factor of P every time. Now, of course, if a is a V-frick. If P is a V-frick prime base A, it doesn't happen. Sometimes the order stabilizes, but eventually they'll start going up. But in any case, typically this happens. And so if you kind of imagine A modulo powers of P is kind of like a vertical thing, kind of like when Alvaro was talking about for Galois representations, P power cyclotomic fields is like, you know, sort of studying things vertically and then looking at quadratic, all the quadratic fields, the Galois extension generated by all the square roots, like some horizontal Galois extension. So here, looking at the order of the single integer modular powers of one prime is kind of like some vertical story, but we could still, we could ask instead, what about um, the order of A mod P as P varies? Don't let the exponent grow, let the prime change. And of course, we ignore the primes that divide A. So, well, one thing we can say for sure is that the order will divide P minus one because it's the order of an element in the group Z mod P star of size P minus one. Is the order infinitely often P minus one? And so um, that's the basic question. Given an integer, as P runs through the primes, can the order achieve its biggest possible value infinitely often? So the answer is no, if, for instance, A is a perfect square. 
because if a is a square, a to the p minus p is odd, a to the p minus one over two is one, the order is at most divides p minus one over two, it's never gonna be p minus one. Okay, so the conjecture is, that's the only time we should run into a problem if we're working with um, positive integers. So this was the uh, conjecture of Artin in 1927 that if a is a positive integer, I mean, he allowed a to be a general non-zero integer, and then a little of uh, some other complications can come up, but I don't want to pay attention to those. And a is not a square, then the uh, the set S a of a primes p that don't divide a for which a mod p generates all of z mod p star, its order is as big as possible, this has natural density, or it has a natural density bigger than zero. And in fact, using probabilistic heuristics, he guessed that the density should be given by the following infinite product. One product, of one over, one minus one over L times L minus one as L runs through the primes. And this is an absolutely convergent infinite product around 0.373. Okay, around 37%. So actually maybe Artin initially guessed this only when A is two, but then he said, thought, well, it really should be true in general as long as A is not a square. So there are some interesting heuristics that lead to this um, guess. If you, um, so I'll just say, if you know some algebraic number theory, there's a nice little uh, paper by Ram Murthy in the Mathematical Intelligencer about Artin's primitive root conjecture. And he kind of explains the heuristics that would lead to this, that the L times L minus one is kind of coming from looking at the splitting field of X to the L minus A, and in any case, um, so I don't want to get into the details on that, but um, so Artin had some good reasons for believing this. And um, well, it turned out, so this was Arden's guess in 1927. So, um, so in 1957, 30 years later, um, Derek and Emma Lamer, they found that the natural density when A is five, just numerically, not proof, numerically, seemed to be around point, um, point three nine. 393. You may think, well, come on, you just wait long enough. But it seemed to be systematically like 5% too big. And once Artin heard that, he's like, oh, I made a mistake. How do you make a mistake in a heuristic? I mean, he realized that there was some kind of subtle de dependence where he thought that there was, and kind of like what I had written about here, where there's some kind of the, the two power extensions and the Two power cyclotomic extension, there's a little bit of unexpected intersection and overlap. So, the kind of heuristic that Artin had in mind that led him to this conjecture, um, by the way, notice that the density is independent of A. Oh, interesting. Um, but it seemed when A was five, it was a little bit too small. So, then Artin realized that he made a slight mistake. So, then Artin fixed his conjecture. Um, and it basically amounts to saying that the natural density, it should depend on A, especially if A has prime factors that are one mod four. And I can just give you a concrete formula. Infinite series over all N, the Mobius function, divided some kind of inclusion exclusion thing going on over the field degree FNA over Q, where FNA is the uh, splitting field of t to the n minus a over q. All right. So in any case, um, you can write it as an infinite product, and sometimes if n has a prime factor that's one mod four, it's not quite. It's usually if a is square free, and and but, well, in any case, um, it's often given by Artin's expression. But as an example, um, it turns out that his guess, the refined guess, um, turns out to be uh, twenty over nineteen times the uh, expression that I gave you before. And this uh, this expression is around, um, yeah, this is anyways around 0.3935. Okay, so it's pretty good.
Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it turned out in 1967, why don't all these years end in seven? I'm 27, 57, 67. So then in 1967, uh, Hooley, Hooley proved that Barton's primitive root conjecture follows from the general Riemann hypothesis for zeta functions and number fields. So it's a conditional result, a conditional on something that very widely believed. Um, and so as soon as someone announces a proof of the general Riemann hypothesis, here's a concrete com uh, uh, consequence. The Orton primitive root conjecture is true. And I, I will just say that the proof uses the uh, Chebotarov density theorem. Proof uses the Chebotarov density theorem with error term. Kind of for similar reasons, similar but more subtle reasons as the example that I gave before. Okay, um, for Chebotara, for the fields, if you want to do it for the number A, the primitive root conjecture for A, you have to use the Chebotara density theorem for the fields, the splitting fields of all the t to the n minus A fields, well, at least when n is square free. Um, and so the Artin primitive root conjecture has tons of variations. Maybe you don't want to see when one element generates the whole group mod P infinitely often, but what about if I gave you two elements? What about two and three together generating the units mod P infinitely often? What's the density of that? Or, or maybe I don't want the subgroup always to be everything, but maybe to have index two or anyway, they're all, or maybe replace the multiplicative group with elliptic curves and reduce a point mod P and is that cyclic? So there are all kinds of variations on this question and they all, the proofs, to bound the error terms all involve the uh, Chebotar density theorem. And so as one example, to connect to kind of a result um, from recent years, if we look at the topic of uh, prime gaps, for example, so Maynard and Tao had proved famously that uh, for the primes, if we, the first prime is two, very much. Oh, not less than. Th well, it is less than three, but that's not what I wanted to say. Um, so if I if I label the primes, two equals p one less than p two, and this will be the last comment I make. P three and so forth are the primes, and you give me an integer at least two. They prove that the gap between infinitely often, if you look at the n plus m minus one prime minus the nth prime, so it's kind of a gap of m prime, so pn to pn n plus one, n plus two up to n plus m minus one, it's kind of a gap of m primes, infinitely often, I mean, this, there's a universal kind of bound, infinitely often is below some constant like 246 or something like that. So if you look at consecutive primes, infinitely often they're gonna be at most like 246 or infinitely, look at primes three in a row, infinitely often, the gap will be at most some constant, maybe depending on M. And this is just with all primes, unrestricted. And so, for example, uh, Paul Pollock showed in 2014, um, the same result, focusing only on, oh, and the proof, uh, what I'm about to say, focusing only on the, uh, the primes P for which some number A you know, generates the units mod P. So if you only focus on the primes for which, for a choice of A, that's not, you know, say grading the two and not a perfect square. So Art Artin says, you know, there should be lots of these primes. Um, so assuming um, not using GRH, but using the Chebotarov density theorem, he was able to, uh, with error term, he was able to show that you know, just on these primes that infinitely often, you know, look at M tuples, you know, they have bounds and gaps. Okay. So anyway, Chebotarov density theorem always in use ever since 1922 and always will continue to be in use. So that's a good place to stop. Thanks.